How do you determine flipping science? We're looking at nanomaterials. So here's the science understanding that we're looking at. We're looking at um, nanomaterials are substances that contain particles in the size range of 1 to 100 nanometers, then suggest uses of materials including nanomaterials given their properties. So a nanomaterial is a very small material. Um, the definition of the scale we're working at is between 1 and 100 nanometers, and this is very, very, very small. So 1 nanometer, and the symbol for nanometer is little n, little m, uh, it's 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, uh, so that's a billionth of a metre, which is very hard to get your head around in terms of size. Um, if you divided a millimetre into a million parts, that's a nanometer. So one millionth of a millimetre is a nanometer. So that's the scale that we're working on. Here's a bit of a picture showing those scales. Um, here's the carbon nanotubes that we're going to talk about. So their size between, they're kind of the 1 to the 10 nanometers. So this is a logarithmic scale. Um, here we've got quantum dots, which we're not really going to talk about, and then we've got the gates between resistors over here at 100 nanometers. So it's this range here that we're looking at for uh, nanomaterials. Um, nanomaterials exist in nature. Um, here's some pictures of some things that contain nanomaterials. Um, this is a virus here. Um, we can see the scale down here, 10 nanometers. So the capsid, which is the outside of the virus, which is what attaches to the cell um, and then injects the DNA or RNA, here we can see, we could measure this and we can see it, um, that it's then that nano, nano scale, that between 1 and 100 nanometers across. Here's a picture of an opal that I took when I was at uh, the American Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, yeah, in uh, Washington, D.C. So it's an opal from South Australia, where I am. Um, the cause of the uh, interesting light effects when light hits an opal is down to the existence of these little spheres of silica that are present in the um, opal and the size of those uh, silicon spheres is between 150 to 300 nanometers so we're still in that kind of scale area. Um, here's a gecko, I took this photo when I was at um, the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. It's a gecko that's um, attached to a glass wall. The reason why geckos can attach to glass walls is on their feet they have these little ridges those ridges have ridges, and those ridges have ridges called spatulae. The size of those spatulae is between 10 and 15 nanometers, so they're very, very small. And what that means is the whole foot gets a really large surface area. And you get interesting van der Waals effects between the um, feet of the gecko on whatever surface they're touching, and that's why they're very, very sticky. So it's down to those really, really small structures on their feet. So the nanomaterials we're going to talk about are forms of graphene. So graphene, here's a picture of what graphene would look like if you could see it. It's a hexagonal, a hexagonal arrangement of carbon, um, and it's one atom thick, so it's a, the width of carbon, essentially, if you go from top to bottom. Um, what's interesting about graphene is its properties, so it's ridiculously strong. So a few years ago, a scientist did a calculation. If you had a sheet of graphene that was as thick as uh, glad wrap or plastic wrap, um, you could put an elephant on a pencil upright, and that pencil wouldn't be able to go through the graphene. That's how strong it is. Um, there's some interesting calculations involved with that. They looked at what type of elephants and so on. Um, how strong the pencil would have to be as well as one of those questions. But it's really, really strong. As well as being strong, it also conducts heat and electricity very well. Um, so again, that has implications for its uses in electronics industries, for example. So there's application possibilities for graphene in solar panels, uh, material science, um, and also in biological engineering, because you could you can wrap this graphene in a particular shape, so we're going to look at some of those shapes now. So one structure is called a fullerene, so I have a little fullerene model here. Um, it's where you take your graphene and you roll it into a ball or a tube. This is a ball, and these are usually referred to as buckyballs, and we'll talk about why in a second. Um, the first one down here, we have a picture of it, is carbon-60. Um, it was discovered in the 1980s, I think they started theorising of it. Um, it's 60 carbons, um, you have one carbon joined to three carbons, that means there's some electrons left over, and that means they're conductive as well, so they, they conduct electricity. Um, this one was called Buckminster Fullerene, after an architect called Buckminster Fuller, who was a Canadian architect who had some really interesting ideas. Um, he liked working on geodesic domes, so we use um, uh, 
geometric shapes to make dome structures. Um, here's one of the geodesic domes that he designed. This is in Montreal. It was at a World's Fair. Um, this is another building he designed. It's called a Dymaxion House. Um, it's a round house made out of aluminium. Um, it's very interesting architecturally inside. This is in a museum in Detroit. Um, there's a few of them around. That one's the best preserved. And you can have a walk around. You can see some of his eyes ears. Um, so Bucky Ball is named after Buckminster Fuller. Um, they have all kinds of uh, uses at the moment, but they're also being investigated for other uses. So they're used medically in contrasting agents. So a contrasting agent is something that's um, if you're using an MRI. It's the dye that's injected into you so that um, it shows up on the MRI scan. So they're currently using fullerenes in those, but they're being investigated for gene and drug delivery. So in terms of drug delivery, if you could make the molecule that um, is the drug that you're trying to insert into the patient, um, you can associate it with a fullerene and then it might travel better through the body systems. It's, it's very early on in the use of the um, science. So another form of fullerene that's not a ball is called a nanotube. So these are rolls of graphene where you, you're essentially folding the graphene over on itself and making a tube. Um, and these are ex exceptionally strong and stiff as well. So because they have this strength and stiffness, they're currently being used in interesting um, places, but just again, very early on in the science. So there's a bicycle company that puts nanotubes into its um, components that need to be particularly strong. Um, there's also a company that's mixing it with epoxy, which is a synthetic um, adhesive. So mixing the nanotubes with the epoxy makes it work a lot better. So it's 30% stronger than a regular epoxy. Here's a picture of a scanning electron micrograph of a nanotube. So you can see the tube structure and you can see how it kind of rotates around. There's different forms of um, nanotubes depending on how you join the carbons together. Um, other applications that are being investigated are energy storage, which is always an issue. Um, how do you store energy in a way where it can be extracted easily and then stored back again? Photovoltaics, so uh, solar panels, and also again in bio biomedical devices. They're looking at using these um, st as structures to help grow cells on so then you can make things like bone or um, other body structures using the um, nanotubes as kind of the basic matrix underneath. So as with any new technology, there are some problems. Um, it is ridiculously new and it's so new and the, the structures are so small that it's very hard to work with them. It's very hard to um, make them to start with and it's hard to figure out applications and how to interpret those applications. How do you, how do you move something that's a billionth of a metre across? It's a very difficult idea to work with. Currently producing nanotubes and buckyballs, um, you can do it cheaply, but once you do it, you need to extract them from the production process that you make, and that's where the expensive is. So they're ridiculously expensive. They're more expensive than gold per gram by many, many factors. Um, this is coming down as people are developing new and newer technologies, but um, they're still quite expensive. There are some questions about their health implications. Because they're very small structures, um, if you're breathing them in or taking them into your body, um, they're also very stable, so we don't know what effects that's going to have. There's been some uh, bit of looking at the health implications of using these things in terms of toxicity. Um, but you want to be very cautious whenever you're introducing small structures that will last a long time in anywhere near a body. So today on Flipping Science, we looked at nanomaterials and their possible uses. That's it for Flipping Science today. See ya.